the Jewish channels we can review. In light of the Kletsky murder, could Orthodox policies be putting children in more danger? Same-sex marriage comes to New York with Jews in the leadoff position, new job training programs, and more of the Jewish news that's changing your world right now in this episode of the Week in Review. Hello, and welcome to the Jewish Channel's Week in Review. I'm Stephen I. Weiss. Are ultra-Orthodox rabbinic policies creating a dangerous environment for Jewish children? New statements on abuse and molestation in Orthodox circles point in two different directions. The issue has hit the headlines again owing to the abduction and murder of eight-year-old Leiby Kletsky by a fellow member of his Orthodox community. The alleged murderer, Levy Aaron, reportedly has psychological problems that could include schizophrenia, and several other families have come forward to tell reporters that Aaron had previously tried to abduct their children. This raises the obvious question, what level of culpability does the Orthodox community have in the Kletsky murder? And a second question is, will the abduction and murder of an innocent child change any of it? One ultra-Orthodox leader, Rabbi Shmuel Kamenetsky, recently made comments stating that abuse of children should be reported to rabbis rather than police. These comments by the rabbi have raised alarm bells for many who have seen how rabbis have failed to remove abusers in the past and how rabbis have often worked aggressively to try to discredit accusers and keep alleged abusers from facing any consequences. In response to the blow-up over Kamenetsky's comments, the Agudath Israel of America, the largest body of ultra-Orthodox Jewry, and in whose Council of Torah Sages Rabbi Kamenetsky is a member, issued a statement clarifying the organization's position, but also showed that it more or less agrees with Kamenetsky. The organization says that law enforcement should only be notified when a specific threshold has been met. But how is someone supposed to know when that threshold has been met? The statement declares, quote, The individual shouldn't rely exclusively on their own judgment. Rather, he should present the facts to a rabbi. In this way, Agudath Israel essentially calls upon all abuse cases to be presented to rabbis, leaving the rabbis to make decisions about when cases of abuse merit bringing in law enforcement to investigate their community members or colleagues. In the recent Kletsky case, despite several allegations that Levy Aaron's conduct merited investigation in the months and years before his abduction of the eight-year-old in Brooklyn, no one in the community contacted the police. In contrast to Agudath Israel, the Modern Orthodox Rabbinical Council of America, which represents approximately 750 Orthodox rabbis in the United States, released a statement with a very different message, saying, quote, Consistent with Torah obligations, if one becomes aware of an instance of child abuse or endangerment, one is obligated to refer the matter to the secular authorities immediately. However, the RCA statement did have a key qualification, saying, as always, where the facts are uncertain, one should use common sense and consultations with experts, both lay and rabbinic, to determine how and when to report such matters to the authorities. And at the same time, as the ultra-Orthodox rabbinate is doubling down on its policies that have opened it up to allegations of protecting abusers while challenging accusers in recent decades, another case of abuse is coming to light. Ultra-Orthodox rabbi Moshe Keller was arrested this week on sexual abuse charges, Released on $5,000 bail and forced to surrender his passport, the rabbi will face charges on seven counts of various alleged crimes. In another story of rabbis behaving badly, a Brooklyn rabbi previously charged with murder and mortgage fraud is now facing additional charges asserting he was involved in money laundering. Rabbi Victor Colton was charged in December of last year with contracting the killing of his nephew and a former police officer. The 41-year-old rabbi had previously been arrested for mortgage fraud, and now he's facing new charges of money laundering, conspiracy, and grand larceny. While the rabbi has been in jail since December, the indictment includes allegations of crimes committed in jail as recently as February. The new charges include 19 counts. Moving on to a story of celebration. New York State's first same-sex marriages began this past Sunday. The first ever same-sex marriage in New York City was of a Jewish couple, and Mayor Michael Bloomberg officiated at a special Jewish wedding for two members of his administration. And of course, there was so much more, as Meredith Gansman reports. On Sunday night in New York City, Jonathan Mintz and John Feinblatt took their wedding vows on the grounds of Gracie Mansion, the official residence of Mayor Michael Bloomberg, who presided. There we go, it actually fits, way to go. In keeping with Jewish tradition, a glass was broken, but this time by both newlyweds. And with a performance by Broadway star Joel Grey, the Mince Feinblatt wedding was only the most high profile of many Jewish same-sex marriages held Sunday. Earlier that day, just one month after the New York State Senate passed the marriage equality bill, hundreds of gay and lesbian couples lined up outside City Hall waiting to get married, and many of them were Jewish. 
Outside City Hall in Foley Square, Congregation Beit Simchat Torah, or CBST, New York's largest LGBT synagogue, even set up a rainbow chuppah for on-the-spot same-sex Jewish marriages. What are you most excited for as you officiate these series and series of I Do's? Some of these couples have been together since before I was born. They have an entire lifetime of experiences, of love, of challenges. They've been the witnesses, and I couldn't be here today as an openly lesbian rabbi without the work that they've done. So being here to sanctify and to, to add the stamp of the power of the state is just a tremendous privilege for me. Connie Kurtz and Ruth Berman, known as the grandmothers of the LGBT community, are one of those couples who paved the way for marriage equality. They were overjoyed to finally wed after more than 30 years together. That's the best. This is the way New York is, and this is the way the rest of the country should be. <laughs> this is very special. This is very special, and we're feeling it emotionally and uh, spiritually, and the fact that our rabbi is here um, just adds to it. Congregation Beit Simchat Torah has always held Jewish weddings for the LGBT community, but Rabbi Weiss said being recognized by the state provides an even greater sense of validation. This is a to an entirely different level. It's a step on the road to equality. We're not totally there. CBST's communications director Gabriel Blau and his husband had their second wedding ceremony on Sunday. It feels absolutely amazing. Uh, my husband and I chose to have a Jewish wedding uh, five years ago and this was really the end of that event. It feels like a five year long event. We couldn't be more excited and happy that the state has caught up to recognize our family. Blau stressed, however, there's still a long way to go toward complete equality for gays and lesbians in the United States. First of all, we do not have uh, federal recognition, which is where many of the rights that are still denied to us uh, are. We also have to make sure that every single state recognizes marriages, all marriages done in all states. But for now, while hundreds were wed on Sunday in New York's LGBT community, a great many more now say they plan on tying the knot. Alavai. <laughs> Baruch Hashem. I'm hoping. You know, would I like to? I would love it to. Yeah, absolutely. Marriage, kids. I'm going to stand under that chuppah. From City Hall for the Jewish Channel, I'm Meredith Gansman. Thank you, Meredith. A different kind of celebration was about the ability to get a new job. Rebecca Honig Friedman has that story. You might recall previous TJC reports on the Metropolitan Council on Jewish Poverty's Project Metropair, which provides free home repairs for the elderly and disabled. Now, a new Met Council program is using Project Metropair as a training ground for individuals seeking employment as handymen. We were driving around all over Brooklyn, you know, helping people with assistance rails, door locks. He covered everything from laying down the floor to blueprint reading to reading a ledger and everything, and everything was great. Steve Solomon and T. Russell are recent graduates of Met Council's Handyman Training Program. Run out of its Career Services Division, the program was designed, coordinator Jody Steinhardt said, as a way to broaden Met Council's services to the unemployed and underemployed in New York. We knew that handyman was a growing industry, and we also knew that in terms of the population that Met Council serves, not everyone is academically inclined. And we needed to be able to do a program for people who are more tactile. Funded by a $254,000 federal grant from the Department of Labor, the Handyman Training Program provides students with a free 10-week training course at CUNY's New York City Tech, ongoing support from career services counselors, and a six-week paid apprenticeship with one of the seasoned handymen from Met Council's Housing Maintenance and Metropair Services. That unique hands-on training in the field was especially appreciated by students. Practice makes perfect. You really have to, you know, what you learn in school is one thing, but when you're in the field, it's a whole different ball game. To hear more from the graduates of Met Council's Handyman Training Program, Tune in to the full broadcast version of the Week in Review. And to find out how you can join their ranks, call Met Council's training hotline at 212-452-9549. Thank you, Rebecca. That's all for this week. From all of us here at the Jewish Channel, be well. The Jewish Channel is available on cable. Iowa Optimum Channel 291, Time Warner Cable Channel 528, RCN Channel 268, Verizon Fios Channel 900, Cox Cable Channel 1, and new this month, Bright House Channel 330. For more information, visit TJCTV.com.